Hey guys, Jeff here. Today, let's scan some film. If you haven't seen my video on developing film, you can check it out up here. So I'm going to be scanning some of this film that I developed at home. I'm using a Canon 5DSR camera mounted on this copy stand. I'm using a 50 millimeter lens and I've got an extension tube currently on the camera to help me get a little bit closer to the film. So I'm going to mount my film here in this, uh, the brand of this light is Skier, S-K-I-E-R. The Skier Sunray box. So I'm mounting my 120 film. I shot this with a Fuji GW693 camera. I'm going to mount it in here. And then I'm going to take a photograph. So I'm working here in Capture One Pro. You could certainly do this in Lightroom as well. I just happen to prefer Capture One for my workflow. It's a really good idea to get um, either canned air or a little blow off bubble blower um, and hit your film ahead of time with that. I also like to handle my film using one of these anti-static gloves. That's really helpful as well. And first thing I do is I wanna make sure that I'm working with a shutter speed that's fast enough. I don't want any just motion from the building or anything to uh, affect the sharpness of the shot. I'm working at an aperture of f8, so I have a nice depth of field to speed sort of ratio there. And then right now I have ISO 200 set. I'm going to plug in a name on, on the ingest just so that I can kind of stay organized. And then I'm going to take a shot. Good, it's a good starting point. So I generally kind of look at the exposure of the film base and I look with my eyes at the film itself to see if I'm, you know, pretty close to what I'm seeing in tone to the film itself. And that's looking pretty good. One thing I have to do in Capture One is get into the base characteristics. This helps with adjusting my color. It's trying to apply an ICC profile for this camera ahead of time. And so what I wanna do is I wanna strip that out. So I come here to effects and I say no color correction. And under the curve auto, I set it to linear response. And then I kind of take another just visual look at it to make sure that that exposure is looking correct. Right now, this green that you see is the focus mask, which is a really helpful feature in Capture One to be able to, to tell if I'm sharp, if I'm in focus. And so it's indicating on my film that I indeed am in focus here. Um, and I'm feeling pretty good about that. So I'm gonna export this file. We'll export it as a 16-bit TIFF. And I'm gonna go ahead and apply, since I'm taking this to Photoshop and in Photoshop I'm set to Adobe 98, I'm gonna apply that on the output and I'm gonna go ahead and click process. Now I think the most important parts of this whole equation are that you have a really consistent light source. Um, you know, I've tried a variety of different kinds of just like light tables, LED panels, and I found that that not only are they not quite bright enough, and I end up with kind of a slower exposure, which then introduces any kind of shake in the building or just anything like that, or the shake from the camera forces me have, have to be in mirror up mode. Um, but sometimes the actual light panel itself is not an evenly distributed light source. And, uh, and then I get kind of weird banding in the, in the scan. Whereas this little unit that I'm using, I find is, you know, so far been better for um, being able to hold the film in place. And once I kind of get everything dialed, I can just kind of move the film and take shot after shot after shot and ingest all of my film shots right into Capture One, export them, open them up in Photoshop and process them from there. In my particular scenario, you know, I guess my only lament about it is that the copy stand that I got online was about $70. I should probably upgrade and be willing to spend a couple hundred dollars because this one's definitely got some issues. It's a little janky. It kind of sags. It's really not that great. I wouldn't recommend this particular one. I'm not even going to list it in the video. Um, I would say, you know, be prepared to spend a couple hundred bucks on your copy stand. Really get something that's going to hold your camera. This one's probably meant for a smaller camera than the 5DSR. So now I'm going to open up this photograph in Photoshop and work with it there. All right, now that we have the, the file in here, I always want to make sure that when I'm working with this, that I actually, in my photograph, capture a little bit of the edge of the film. Um, so just initially, I'm going to give this kind of a quick crop like so. I only really need one edge of the film to do this. And 
I'm gonna crop it again when I don't need that, but starting things out, I kinda wanna have that film base, I'll show you why. First thing we wanna do is do an inversion, so we're gonna get a regular curve going. I'm gonna grab my black point, drag it straight up, drag, grab my white point, drag it straight down. So that's my inversion. I can even name my layer that. Now I could hit Command I or Control I and invert the file. Um, I guess one reason why I might want to do it here with a curve is that I have a curve involved. Instead of it being just a single history state, this is something that I could actually, this curve is something I could go back to to make any other kind of tonal adjustments should I need to. Whereas Command I, Control I, um, Image Invert doesn't give me that option. It just inverts it, that's it. But I think they're kind of doing the same thing in the end. Now, if you are totally unsure what I'm talking about with curves, be sure to check out our video here. All right, so the next thing I do is I need a new blank layer. So I'm gonna come here to my new layers and I'm gonna fill that, shift to delete, and I'm gonna choose color. And I'm gonna use the, the color picker to choose the film base here, which is this kind of teal edging here that's happening. I click okay, click okay again. And what I need to do is I'm looking to subtract this color and tone out of the shot. So I'm sampling it and then coming to the blending mode, subtract, boop. And that gives me kind of my, my base file. Now I need to set the white point. So I'm gonna get another curve going, and I can even name this white point. And the way that we do this is I get into my red, green, and blue values. I go to red, and I'm gonna hold the option key, alt on the PC, and I'm gonna drag my white point over towards the edge of this little mountain range until I start to see it appear like so. And then I'm gonna back it off. I don't wanna clip it. And I'm gonna do the same thing in the green channel. I'm gonna hold the option key. Holding the option key or alt key allows me to see the clipping. And I drag that right into the point that it starts to clip and then I back it off because I don't wanna clip that. Same thing with the blue. Usually the, they all end up kind of the same input point anyhow. Um, drag it over right to the edge, good. Now, more often than not, the files still have kind of a blueness to them. So I almost always, for all these shots, I'm looking to reduce a certain amount of blue out of the shot. I also find that I have to add some magenta, that they're usually a little on the green side. And sometimes I'll add a little bit of red, depending. But I get back to my RGB, and at this point, I can start to manipulate my black point. I can kind of give it a little bit of an S curve. On this particular day, I was most interested in what was happening in the sky. Okay, so I can kind of Crush that down for sure. My foreground and that path on the left were all kind of in shadow. I was interested in this tree. I was interested in the tone of the sky. Now, if I want further control of that, I could certainly add in a hue and saturation layer. And for whatever reason with these film shots, often the, um, often the cyan can be represented a little strangely. So often I'll go right into the cyan channel in the hue saturation and I'll push that a little bit into blue a bit. And then maybe I'll look at bringing my master saturation up touch. And maybe I'd even look at, at in that cyan, bringing the saturation of the cyan up a bit to see if I can get a little more punch out of that sky. Now, one thing I can do is I can come back down to my base file here. I don't need the film edge anymore, so I can crop that out. That's done. So now, should we choose, we could do a little bit of luminosity masking. I'm gonna come here to my channels panel, and I'm gonna hold the command or control on the PC key, and I'm going to click on the RGB, which loads my highlight values. I'm gonna come back to layers, and I wanna place this, I'd like to place this above my white point, but below my hue and saturation. So I'm gonna come back to curves, and I'm gonna load these marching ants as a curve, which you can see if I option click the mask, it's dialing in on the highlight portions of the photo. Now I could command click this again and choose select inverse, command shift I, and I could load another curve adjustment, which then gives me the option to be able to make adjustments just to the shadow portions of my image as well. So if I come back to the highlight here, click on the curve, gives me the ability to make some adjustments just to the highlight portion of the file, which is kind of nice. I can put like a little S curve, which in increases some of the saturation as well as some of the tonality of just the highlight portion of the image. Now it's starting to come together. It's starting to look like what I saw 
that day when I was out there. And as I remember it, you know, things were pretty shadowy along the shore. I don't want to clip those out. I can go ahead and kind of brighten those up a touch and maybe I'll even revisit my saturation and pump it up a bit more. Probably the final thing I would do in the end would be to select the image itself and apply a certain amount of sharpening. And there's a number of ways you can apply sharpening. I would probably just come in and maybe apply um, a higher radius like six and an amount of 30 that's lower. That would be one way you could do it. You could certainly also apply a higher amount like 100 to 200 with a radius that's between one and two and that would probably do the same thing here. Um, there's kind of a number of ways to approach sharpening, different ways different people do it. I click OK. And uh, that would be, you know, sort of a base level photograph that I could start with. In all reality, we're filming a video here, so I have some lights on in the office. But when I'm doing this, I'm usually doing this in the dark. That way I don't have any other color cast hitting the film and being infiltrated by any of that. Excellent. You can see the file comes in. It wants to try to append its ICC profile. I come back and I tell it no color correction, linear response. I'm good with that. Little green bits are indicating um, that my film is sharp. I can go ahead and I can hit output and that sends that to my output folder. Here it is, which I can then just drag right into Photoshop. And then once in Photoshop, I basically can repeat those same steps. Now what's cool is I can also set up an action. Um, you know, some of these I'm going to be doing kind of over and over and over again, so why not set up an action? I can come here to my actions, hit plus, and I can call this film inversion. I can click record. Now, first thing I want to do is I want to get my curve out there. And I'm going to do an inversion with it, Oop, just like that. Next thing I need is I need that blank in there. Now, if Nothing's changed, my film is all the same film, film base, my exposures are all the same. Ostensibly, I could be using the exact same sort of teal film base in here. So I can hit Shift, Delete, use the same color as the color before, and set that to Subtract. Again, still recording here. I know I'm gonna want a curve in place for setting my white point, but those will be specific to each image. I'm just gonna get that in place. And then I'll probably want a couple more for my luminosity masking, but I'll get those kind of set and ready once we're, once we're there. I can hit stop, and now I have a film inversion action set up that I can hit play on every time I bring a new file into Photoshop. I don't have to do all those steps. It'll get me to this point right off the bat, and then from there I can make my final adjustments. It's a nice way to speed up the efficiency. So from here, I'm going to go ahead and do that same thing. I'm gonna to come to my red channel, this tall spike here, that's the edge of the, that's the, edge of the film here. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and crop that out now that we've subtracted that out. Um, I don't need that. So I can go ahead and crop in on this file, like so. And I can rotate this file, image, image, image rotation 90 clockwise. That way I'm, at least I'm looking at the photo the way I ought to be looking at the photo. And then I can come here to my red channel and I can set my white point option or alt, bringing that white point over to the edge of clipping. Same with the green, bring that over to the edge of clipping. Same with the blue, bring that over right to the edge of clipping. And then I'm gonna to start to dial some of this blue out. And it also usually needs a little bit of the green taken out of it, kind of bring it into the correct color. And then I'll usually get into the RGB at this point, and that's when I'll start making some tonal adjustments with an S curve, like so. Then I can come here to Hue and Saturation. And there's not any blue sky in here for me to worry about, but I might play with like how much saturation I want to see out of this. And, you know, crank my saturation up. And from there, if I want, I can get into luminosity masking and adjusting just the highlight portions of the image versus just the shadow portions of the image. I think one of the things I enjoy about this process is that it's kind of like taking something just from film and having to really mold it around to get it to look like what you ended up with. It's 
totally different process than a digital raw file where it's pretty much good to go. Just, you know, I mean, really like honestly in a lot of digital files, slap a preset on it and it's gonna look pretty good. This is a whole nother animal. It's, it's as if you've got this cookie batter that doesn't look anything like the cookie that you're gonna end up with. And you really have to kind of like use these Photoshop tools to kind of manipulate it and get it to the spot where it looks good. What's also really surprising to me is how bad it looks at first and how if you spend time with it using curves and hue and saturation and some of these lum luminosity masking techniques, you can get it looking really good. Just all depends on the film and the light of the day and of course your photographic skills, your exposure, things like that. So if you liked this video, thought it was kind of intriguing, hit that like sign. Feel free to subscribe down there, up there. You can hit that little bell, be notified. Leave some comments down in the comments area if you'd like. Hope you found this interesting. Thanks for watching.